Good day and welcome to the Kendron NV Third Quarter Results 2018 Analyst Call. Today's conference is being recorded at this time. I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Jörg Van Bergen. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Welcome to Kendron's Q3 2018 Results Teleconference. My name is Jörg Van Bergen, Kendron's CEO, and with me here is Frank Solomons, our CFO. I will start the meeting with some remarks regarding our Q3 results, after which we'll have time for Q&A. We will post a recording of this call and of the Q&A on Kendrion's website as soon as is practicable. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that certain statements contained in my remarks and in the answers to your questions constitute forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements rely on a number of assumptions concerning future events and are subject to uncertainties and other factors, many of which are outside the company's control, that could cause actual results to differ materially from such statements. As you will have seen from our press release of this morning, we've had a difficult quarter as the market for passenger cars has deteriorated over the past few months, especially in China and Europe. The backlog in test and validation procedures to comply with the new Worldwide Harmonized Light Vehicles Test Procedures, or WLTP, persisted, adding to broad market uncertainty. You may have seen press announcements from many automotive companies indicating lower sales. This has also affected the sales of our leading automotive customers and led to a 9.6 million euro or 8% drop in total revenue in Q3 compared with last year and a reduction of 2.3 million euro or 23% in EBITDA, mostly caused by our passenger cars business. Our normalized EBITDA margin was 7.2%, down from 8.6% last year. Normalized net profit was 4.6 million euro, which was 1.3 million euro lower than in Q3 2017. We continue to implement the simplification measures we announced earlier in the passenger cars business unit and expect all measures to be effective on schedule as of the 1st of January 2019. And notwithstanding the short-term pressure, we continue to focus our resources and investments in passenger cars, specifically in the areas of electrification, autonomous driving, safety and comfort, in permanent magnet brakes for robotics, and in China, where we see and tap into healthy growth opportunities. And talking about China, passenger cars revenue in China posted double-digit growth in Q3 as the ramp-up of new projects more than compensates for the downward pressure on existing production. In August 2018, at our Capital Markets Day, we announced our strategic update for 2019 to 2023. Since 2016, Kendrion has simplified and refocused the company based on the Simplify, Focus and Grow pillars. This has increased our profitability, improved our resilience to market uncertainty such as the one we are facing today, and has placed us in a good position to benefit from important long-term trends. We remain focused on these pillars with emphasis on focus and grow for the next five years. The additional simplification measures taken in our passenger, passenger cars business unit to further streamline its R&D organization and to address pockets of inefficiency are on track and are inspected to be fully implemented by the start of 2019. These measures include the creation of a dedicated center of excellence for sound software electronics in Malente. Our small R&D center in Ilmenau has been sold and is operating independently following a management buyout in October 2018. The cost reductions and restructuring measures implemented in Q3 resulted in one-off costs of 0.6 million euro with corresponding savings on an annualized basis of 1.0 million euro. And this brings the year-to-date one-off costs to 6.5 million euro with annualized savings of 5.2 million euro. 
We reiterate our expectation of one-off costs of around 7.0 million euro with corresponding savings of 5.5 million euro on an annualized basis for the full year 2018. With respect to growth, pipeline momentum in our three areas of focus remains strong. Our investments in additional resources and in additional capacity in both Villingen and China are on track. And these investments are a direct result of Cambrion's expanding project pipeline. I will now review our financials in a bit more detail. The market for passenger cars is really quite poor, as illustrated by a slew of announcements from automotive OEMs and tier 1s. A combination of fears about a China-US trade war, uncertainty around Brexit, the continued and significant testing backlog caused by the implementation of the new WLTP testing protocol and ongoing pressure in diesel combined in Q3. And although we indicated at our Q2 and H1 results announcement in August that we foresaw continued headwinds for passenger cars around pressure on diesel cars and the WLTP backlog, the scope of the volume decline in passenger cars appears to have widened. For instance, European car registrations contracted by 23% year-over-year in September. Year-over-year -year car sales in China declined as well in the third quarter. And as a direct result, our automotive activities posted a decrease in revenues of 10.3% that was fully attributable to the passenger car's business unit. As mentioned, and in contrast, passenger car's revenue in China posted double-digit growth in Q3, driven by the ramp-up of new projects, outstripping the market-related downward pressure on existing productions. Commercial vehicles reported revenue growth, driven by good market conditions for heavy trucks in the United States and agricultural equipment in Europe. In industrial, the economic conditions are more favorable. The German machine building index declined slightly, but is still at a historically favorable level. Industrial posted a revenue decline of 4.3% against a strong Q3 last year, entirely caused by industrial magnetic systems affected by a major textile customer that is showing low order intake and the loss of some smaller customers due to the closure of the Swiss manufacturing operations last year. Industrial control systems continued to do well, driven by higher demand for power heat controllers and increased demand for the medical se in the medical segment. Industrial drive systems, that includes our business for permanent magnet brakes for robots, performed well. Normalized EBITDA in the first nine months of 2018 decreased by 0 0.2 million euro to 31.2 million euro. The normalized EBITDA margin improved from 8.9% in the first nine months of 2017 to 9.0% in year-to-date 2018. Kendrion's financial position is strong. The net debt position at the end of the, of the uh, third quarter was 78.9 million euro, a slight increase compared to Q2 2018. Excluding the effects of IFRS 16, net debt amounted to 64.3 million euro. The increase of 0 0.2 million euro is in line with the third quarter free cash inflow of 0 0.1 million euro and includes the cash out of 2.6 million euro for the acquisition on August the 3rd of 2018 of a 30% minority stake in Newton CFV Inc., a strategic partnership for the development and manufacturing of innovative constant flow valves for the food and beverage industry. Free cash flow in the first nine months was 4.4 million euro compared to 2.6 million euro for the first nine months of 2017. Capital expenditure totaled 20.7 million euro in the first nine months of 2018. Investments for the full year 2018 are expected to be well ahead of the depreciation level as a result of Kendrion's expanding project pipeline and largely due to new automotive projects and the capacity expansion in permanent magnet brakes for robotics. 
Ken Jeong's financial position is strong with a solvency ratio of 48.2% at the end of September 2018. Excluding the effects of IFRS 16, the solvency ratio is 50.1%. The number of employees in full-time equivalents at the end of Q3 2018 stood at 2,573, including 128 temporary employees as compared to 2,661 employees, including 142 temporary employees at the end of Q3 2017, a 3% decrease of 88 FTEs. The number of indirect employees decreased by 52 FTEs and is part of that 88. Finally, a few words on our outlook. I think it's fair to say that the scope of the volume decline that we've seen in the market for passenger cars appears to have taken the market by surprise, and we are no exception. Looking ahead, we expect the difficult market conditions in automotive to impact our 2018 total revenue and EBITDA margin. We now expect our 2018 total revenue to come in slightly lower than in 2017, and expect our underlying EBITDA margin as from the end of 2018, including the annualized impact from simplification measures taken to be more than 9%. I do want to emphasize that this change compared to what we announced at Q2 and first half results is due to developments in the market, mostly for passenger cars. In terms of our operational performance and our project pipeline, we are doing well, and with a leaner and simpler organization, we are more resilient to market-related fluctuations and headwinds that invariably occur, occur from, from time to time. Looking forward, we remain confident about our business fundamentals, with our main objective being to deliver sustainable, profitable growth for the business in the medium to long term and we reiterate our midterm targets of a return on investment of at least 20% and an EBITDA margin of more than 15% by 2023. I now open the line for your questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you wish to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please ensure the mute function on your telephone is switched off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, please press star 1 to ask a question. We will now take our first question from Frank, Frank Clapton from the group Peter Cam. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning, good morning uh, gentlemen. Uh, Frank Clapton from the Peter Cam. First of all, on your uh, revised uh, guidance for the EBITDA margin of more than 9% uh, as of end of 18, so let's say uh, going into 2019, what is your uh, revenue assumption here? Um, do you expect to return to, to top-line growth, or what are your assumptions to get to this uh, 9% EBITDA margin? That's the first question. And then secondly, re maybe related to that, can you remind us uh, of the cost savings? Uh, how much is still going to kick in? And, and, uh, and the timing of this. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, Frank. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, as we said on the revenue side, in, um, at our capital market today, we said we expect uh, the top line of 2018 to be uh, higher than 2017. Now we're saying it's, it's going to be uh, slightly lower in, in our expectation. Uh, now, if you look at the year-to-date revenue, you see that it is roughly at the same level of last year. Uh, 346.7 versus 352.3, so slightly below that. Uh, and with just Q4 to go, you can get a feeling of, of, of where we expect that to end up. And that is yeah, on but that, that basis. On that basis, we talk about uh, the more than 9%, including the annualized contribution from implemented simplification measures. But, but I'm then, uh, sorry to interrupt because I'm more looking into 2019. I, I read the 9% EBITDA margin target also moving into 19. Uh, is there uh, some assumption underlying this, or what can you say about 19 uh, 
Well, so we, we do not guide uh, for 19, as you know. Um, first of all, the, the, the big question is going to be how the market is going to behave in 2019. Now, of course, uh, I, we don't know that, and it, it's, it's hard to really judge that. Uh, it will, of course, impact the overall uh, situation of the whole automotive market, including us. Um, so so I, I do not want to... to uh, um, uh, I don't. I, I do not want to guide for that because I simply don't know. Um, but it is fair to say that we are starting the year with with an EBITDA run rate of that higher than nine percent, and that is, I think, uh, a good position uh, to be in as we are uh, focusing on uh, on all the opportunities that we continue to invest in. Now, your other question was around um, measures that we still uh, expected to uh, to come in in 2019. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. cost savings. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I think the, uh, if you see the, uh, we did show that at the end of the half year we had roughly seven million savings related to uh, simplification measures still which were already implemented at that point in time uh, and implemented in the sense of having been uh, announced. Uh, um, so that, that included the, uh, the significant restructuring we're doing in Malenta, uh, which will be effectuated uh, as per the 1st of January. Uh, so those full savings you would expect to get into uh, next year. Um, and the other thing which was we announced in the third quarter, which was uh, related to the uh, farewell of our activities in, uh, in Ilmenau, uh, which effectively were most of the savings which we are announcing in the third quarter, so the, the one million, most of that related to, to that project. Now, the bulk of that will also fall in, uh, in, in 2019. Now, the 7 million obviously in, in the, let's say in the second half here obviously will slightly come down for those measures which were already implemented before and are starting to see their uh, full year impact. Yeah. But uh, the, the bulk of that obviously still should materialize in 2019 uh, and that's particularly true for the passenger car related savings. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We will now take our next question from Digis Holsfeld from ING. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, morning, uh, gentlemen. Ben Thijs Holsfeld, ING. Um, the first question is about how quickly uh, do you as an organization get a sense of the, <coughs> the slowdown in demand? <coughs> so what's happening uh, exactly during the third quarter? I, I assume that uh, July is uh, still relatively slow, probably August as well. So is the, the bulk of the business is done in September and uh, then the, the, yeah, the relatively weak end market surprised you or how is the, exactly the weight of the September month in the, in the first quarter also from a historic perspective? Yeah, Thijs, good morning. Um, so um, a couple of points here. So first, so, so, so uh, as we, I said in my prepared remarks, uh, the scope of the volume decline, we certainly saw and we flagged that, I think, quite clearly, as you know, at our capital market today in August, uh, that we saw uh, sort of a bit of slowness around the, the, the WLTP and, and diesel. Um, and then actually, so in Q3, that, that got amplified, and, and that certainly uh, surprised us to some extent, but it is, it, we were not alone. I mean, you've seen a slew of, of companies announce in Q3 uh, effectively uh, slowdown of, of car registrations and consumer uh, um, consumer purchases both in Europe and China so it's quite widespread now the way this works and that is one of the features of automotive uh, most of our, our, our uh, the supply chain is on consignment stock so so there is actually our most of our customers can reduce their forecasts and Im immediately then the amount of, of products that they take from us at a moment's notice. That's how they manage their supply chain. So these things tend to happen relatively quickly and without a lot of pre-warning. So, so uh, now then, then the next thing, whether this is September, October, that is all, all you know, that, that typically it, you're a bit slower in August because it's the holiday season and then of course things pick up. That pattern is unchanged, 
although, uh, albeit at a bit of a lower level. And that is, that is really the, the, uh, the situation. Okay. Uh, then also a question, it's a bit of a technical question on the, the P&L line item, uh, how do you call it, uh, change in inventory of finished goods and work in progress. Can you, can you help me remind me how did the, the, this develops and, and what is exactly driving an, an either positive or negative contribution to the, to the P&L? Yeah, no, I think the, uh, you saw the, uh, the total stocks increasing compared to, uh, compared to last year. Uh, and part of that, a big part of that was the effect which you've described as the, uh, the fact that uh, one of our very big customers actually they destocked, actually that was related to the fiscal year end um, in, the, uh, in the September month. Uh, mm -hmm. And that obviously meant that uh, we had our stocks in our consignment stock, but they actually destocked uh, the, the stocks they had themselves in, uh, in, in their business. Um, obviously, if you uh, build the stock level, I think two effects. In fact, if you, you capitalize some of your fixed costs, uh, so that is what you uh, benefit. But your percentage is added value. If, if you would look at it from, uh, let's say, a production value, value point of view, would be a little bit lower because of that. So two, okay. two effects. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, the and last uh, question. Yeah, and I think so. That so most of that difference in stock happened in uh, towards the end of the, the quarter, and I think yeah. you've already mentioned that what we did see in the quarter that the uh, the, the drop against last year in, in revenue was really towards sort of the second half of, of Q3 when it accelerated, um, and, and that then also was measured against a relatively strong end to the quarter in 2017, so that magnified uh, that effect in the comparison. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then a, a, a last question uh, with regards to the uh, yeah the expected circa five percent revenue growth. Uh, I mean, I fully understand that uh, the end markets are as they are, but yeah, if you if you provide such a target, I would assume that you have yeah uh, right kind of a concrete visibility on a certain ramp up of uh, new projects or parts of the business that are really exposed to an, uh, to an uh, market segment which is outpacing the global market. So also uh, yeah, on, on Frank's question, what is your visibility on potential ramp up of these uh, new projects for the next, let's say, two, three quarters? Uh, and then also, of course, adjusted for what, what do you see on old projects that are probably or potentially fading away. Yeah? So the, the, the net effect on your revenue, is that now positive for the next quarters or negative? Can you give us a bit more clarity on, uh, on that? So um, the first thing is to, to mention is that we have very purposely uh, uh, at, at our Capital Markets Day issued a plan that is running for five years. And the reason that is uh, purposely done is that uh, design in cycles, as you know, ties are two to three years. Um, and so your pipeline can be, uh, can be uh, filling up quite quickly and the impact and the positive impact of the revenue ramp is in some cases two, three, four years down the line. That is just the, that is the way this industry behaves. So we continue to be, and this is one of the things I really want to iterate, that if you look at the current uh, market situation, this is, is uh, almost exclusively outside of, of Canadian specific events. The market is what the market is. If people stop buying cars, we stop selling the development actuators to our customers. It is simply that, that's simply the way it is. At the same time, uh, with a, a, a highly streamlined and lean organization, uh, my claim is we are resilient against that. We can, we can weather those types of headwinds that you have to anticipate from time to time in the automotive market. And we continue to invest uh, uh, aggressively and appropriately in these opportunities that we see. Now that is not a quarter by quarter discussion, and that is one of the reasons that that you know uh, we do not want to to because the thing is you you have to overlay your pipeline and the ramp of certain projects that in itself of course fluctuate a little bit, but uh, you don't have them have have them exactly uh, nailed uh, per, per month. 
you have to overlay that with ramp downs which have the same effect and then you have to overlay that with the way the market behaves. So um, the fundamental position of this company is strong. We reiterate that we will, in by 23 in our expectation, have a, a return on invested capital of more than 20. That means, on average, profitability or rentability increase of around 8%. Now, that is not going to be 8% every year or every quarter, but that is what we see in our pipeline and in our opportunities, and we reiterate that. I, I do appreciate that, but of course I'm talking more about, I mean, Canyon is Canyon for for a couple of years, so more the visibility you have on the ramp up of projects that then Canyon did, let's say, three, five years ago, and then the net effect on that. So if there's a positive net impact on the revenue, so would it have been worse if uh, these projects were not there, or is there a negative impact? You, you, you must have some kind of sense on what is adding to the total production capacity of Canyon. Uh, and, uh, well, or you, that you, it is you, decreasing. I point you to the investment that we do in additional capacity in China. I point you to the investment we make in additional capacity for robotic brakes. Uh, I point you to the fact that in in uh, August we we clearly show that in China alone, our pipeline uh, has grown with 240 million euros over the past two years. And of course, you can. You can be sure that we're not saying, okay, that's nice, we stop now. So there is more opportunities there. So, so, and, and I point you to the statements that we're making here that, you know, the pipeline momentum in the areas of focus and in the opportunities that we see are great. So, so uh, the, positive, the, the net effect, to give you an answer to your question, but I know you want to be much more quantitative, but I, I, I don't want to do that, is yes, it is positive. And, and you look at, at the prospects of this company over the next coming years, uh, they are good, very good. Okay, yeah, thank you. As a reminder, please press star one to ask a question. We will now take our next question from Gideon Nunes from Kepler Chiver. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, my first question is on pricing. I think the, uh, vo the pressure on the volume is uh, pretty well understood, but can you talk a bit more about the dynamics that you're seeing in pricing um, and then the difference between new and existing business and maybe differences between geographic regions? Um, and secondly, uh, coming back to that table that you've shown for China, the 240 million, um, with the deteriorating market environment, uh, can you confirm that that number is still standing, or should we take some volume uh, pressures uh, into those expected values as well? Yeah, Guido, thank you. Good morning. Uh, so first, on pricing, um, there isn't actually a, a, a lot of development there. Typically, that is reasonably stable. Uh, we earlier talked about the fact that, that the, the supply chain, the automotive, larger customers, tier ones and OEMs, have a lot of flexibility around calling off product if they need them and, and, and not calling off product if they don't, which of course affects uh, immediately on revenue and also to some extent on working capital and, and stocks. Uh, but on pricing, we have long-term agreements with, with our customers um, that, is more, uh, that is more stable. Uh, so there is not a, a market effect on that. Uh, and on China, I can uh, I can certainly confirm that that pipeline that we talked about um, of 240 million euros is intact. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, it's not not here to 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 update that. And there will be uh, in the future we, we we may decide to do that. But we obviously push extremely hard to actually increase that. But 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 there's certainly not. Uh, any impact on uh, on the 240 a negative impact? Let me say it like that. And that is, I want to make that point a bit broader. Uh, if you look um, at uh, this, is, this that's that, that's sort of a feature of the automotive market. Um, it is a cyclical business. You have to deal with uh, con uh, conjunctural headwinds and such as the one now. They can happen quite unexpectedly, as what you see now in Q3 and or in the second half, I should say more accurately. Did not your not just to us, but to basically all players in this market. At the same time, it's a long-term business. The investment levels uh, in R&D, the projects that we have with other customers around new technologies uh, or updated uh, versions of existing products continue 
uh, without any interruption. Thank you. And maybe as a follow-up on the pricing question, um, can you just give a bit more color on, okay, I get that the existing business has long-term agreements, uh, but what are you seeing on the newer projects? Is that different from before? Um, and also between uh, Europe and China, I'm quite interested how that how that is playing out. No, it is, it is really not no, nothing new. It, it is, I would say, if there is a more mature product that, that is well understood and an incremental improvement over the one before, then typically you are faced with a little bit more pricing pressure, but that is not new. That has always been like that. Uh, if you talk about newer developments um, in, in sort of our future bucket, then, then uh, you, you have a little bit more leeway, if you like. Uh, to negotiate uh, pricing, but on, on average, if you do that through through the portfolio, uh, there is no market change there. Okay, thank you. We will now take our next question from Johan van den Hoeven from IBC. Please go ahead. Good morning, Johan van Hoeven, NBC. Uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, looking at the uh, uh, new automotive projects, uh, uh, previous question sort of uh, might touch upon the same. Uh, the current cycle and sentiment, could it influence the, the time frame of new projects? That there might be some delays. Uh, first question. Second one is on industry. Uh, we were all talking about uh, lower volume in automotive industry was also down 4%. That seems to be largely in magnetic as control and drive showed growth. Am I correct? And can you uh, give some more information about uh, what the reasons were in magnetic and if that's purely Q3 related and not to be expected again going forward? Thank you. Yeah, Johan, good morning. Um, so on the project, so just reiterating a little bit, we just earlier uh, said in response to Guido's question, so, so uh, yeah. projects and the cycles uh, unchanged. So, so uh, time frames are, you know, they're long cycles, but the time frames are, 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 are unchanged. Our customers uh, and ourselves, we continue to work diligently on, on these projects on our pipeline. Uh, not distracted by uh, by the more short-term nature of these types of market uh, fluctuations. So I think that is uh, that is there is there is no, uh, yeah it's all good. Uh, on the industry, you're right. So four percent decline. Just a bit of context. So uh, first of all, it's against quite a strong quarter last year. Last year, you may remember, uh, industry grew 12 percent year over year. So so that is maybe. Uh, not, not, uh, that is maybe to give you a little bit more context to how to interpret that for. Um, generically, as I said also in my remarks, industry is in a good place. Um, the German machine building index that happens to be sort of a good uh, indicator for, for all these different 30 segments that we're in uh, is, it came off a little but is still historically at a good level. We see that in, 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 uh, we see that in, in our business. Now, specifically, then, there's one, one thing in IMS, uh, Industrial Magnetic Systems. There is one larger customer there that is currently facing uh, uh, some, some reductions in their own sell-through of their products. That's a large customer, so clearly we, we, we are dealing with that. It's very difficult to say how long that will, will, uh, will go on. Um, it's not our end market, as you can well imagine. And then there is a very specific element that, that last year, uh, we discontinued operations in uh, in our Swiss factory, and and uh, so so you see a bit of the year-over-year -year impact on that as well. But I mean, say fundamentally, you look at ICS, you look at IDS, you look at everything that happens in the, on the brakes for robots. Uh, industry is uh, is doing well. All right. Thank you. As a reminder, it's Star want to ask a question. <coughs> We'll now take our next question from Martin Verbeek from the IDEA. Please go ahead. Good morning, it's uh, Martin of uh, the IDEA. A um, couple of questions. Firstly, uh, on the back of the, uh, the savings, uh, which you still expect to be realizing at, at the end of the year, mid you were at seven. Um, this quarter you announced a uh, restructuring measure which should bring you uh, one million. Um, if we still look what you expect for Q4, 
that is around about 0.7. So if I add these together, I would be at uh, 8.7. How much of these savings do you think to realize in H2, and therefore, how much do you still expect to have running into 2019? Just to get a better feel for the margin target you uh, you uh, projected. Okay. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, yeah. shall I? Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think it was largely answered to Frank's earlier uh, question. Um, I think we uh, still have to do, by the way, 300,000 days for my guidance. Huh? We're here today at uh, the, the savings level uh, at what is it, 5.2, and we guided for 5.5. So there's 300,000 uh, still to go. Um, obviously, of the seven, uh, some of that will uh, actually uh, certainly the carryover of having already implemented projects earlier that will disappear in the in the second half. Uh, so that will no longer be there. Uh, the 1 million in Q3 related to the uh, stopping of our activities, at least which uh, in the end ended in a management buyout uh, in the research center in Ilmeno. Uh, that is the 1 million savings. Now, I would say three quarters of that probably uh, is, is going to happen in 2018. And then we have the big Melenta restructuring. Um, the, the, those numbers where the Malenta was already included in the seven, in the seven million which we uh, added to the last 12 months when we uh, talked at the capital markets day. Uh, so, so effectively, what I would expect that that, that seven million uh, that will be lower at, at year end. Now, how much it is also depends a little bit how quickly implement or see the saving on some of the other projects, but it will be lower than that uh, than that amount. Uh, which is still carry all 2018. Okay. And then secondly, and then secondly on the uh, diesel, could you provide uh, how much sales you still do in uh, diesel last 12 months, or what kind of decline uh, in absolute terms you experienced in in uh, in the third quarter? Well, what I would say there is, if you recall, uh, we had a quite a specific slide on uh, in the capital market today. If yeah, therefore, recall. because that, uh, that, that mentions yeah. the 63 million uh, uh, last 12 months. Uh, but yeah. if I look at the uh, sales decline in the third quarter, just for automotive, uh, that is, um, I guess, some 7 million. Um, yeah, but and that, therefore, I do be, Yeah, But that Go can't ahead. be just diesel. No, the it's majority not. Should so, be so, lower. So, no, it's, it's good to clarify that it is, it is certainly not. So, so maybe, maybe to, because it's an important point. At H2, we did flag that because of the testing backlog and the pressure on diesel, we, we expected uh, uh, some headwinds in automotive, as you recall. On top of that, we've, we've seen um, uh, additional volume reductions around uh, what we call broad market uh, uncertainty at the consumer end. Uh, now, we, not just us, we've seen that industry-wide, specifically in, in, in Europe and in China, which of course is a large chunk of the global automotive market. Um, this is unrelated to WLTP, this is unrelated to diesel. Um, we think, and, and with us, our, our, our customers, and of course we talk about it in the industry, it is related to broader uncertainty around the potential trade war, around Brexit, and all these other things that I mentioned in my prepared remarks. So it is definitely not the case that the, the, the volume uh, reduction that we have seen uh, in this quarter is uh, attributable to diesel only. It is, it's still there, it's part of it. Uh, the WLTP backlog is part of it, but it's broader than that because of all these other effects that I mentioned. If you look at that 10.3% decline, could you give a broad range, if you would divide it into three, how much is due to diesel, WLTP, and due to car registration? Uh, well, if you, the, the, it's, it's, I don't want to do that, as you probably uh, can imagine, uh, uh, but in order to give you a bit of a pointer, if you look at, you can, you can extrapolate the pressure on diesel from, from what we uh, disclosed in, uh, in, in Q2 or in the first half, that is effectively still with us, and, and uh, the, the other delta is related to the other effects. Okay, thank you. There are no further questions over the telephone at this time.
Yeah, no more questions? There are no questions at this time, no. Okay, then uh, I thank everybody for, uh, for the attention. And if you have any follow-on questions, then, then you know where to find us. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.